nationally acclaimed science author and public speaker. She's a graduate from Cambridge Natural Sciences and she also has a PhD in cancer research. So some of you may be familiar with her from her role as a science expert on high profile TV shows or for her inspirational talks in schools or universities, or you may have seen her at a festival. She's a really passionate advocate for equality and diversity in science. She also gave a TEDx talk on why science needs people who cry and was recently named second honorary STEM ambassador alongside astronaut Tim Peake for her pioneering work in STEM education and also as a role model to young people. She's the author of best-selling children's book, Brain Fizzing Facts, Awesome Science Questions Answered, and that's recently been shortlisted for the Teach Primary Book Award. So after the, over the last 18 months or so, Emily's dedicated her life to raising awareness about the climate and ecological crisis. She's a co-founder of Scientists for Extinction Rebellion, whose declaration statement's now been signed by more than 1,700 scientists across the globe. And she's lead author of their free accessible online guide to the crisis, which is called Emergency on Planet Earth. So we're really pleased to come that she's come to talk to us. And so without saying any more, I'm going to hand over to Emily. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Thank you. Oh, thanks for the hand waves and the little claps and the thumbs up. That's really lovely. <laughs> makes me feel a little bit more relaxed. I'm a little bit nervous to be here and talking to you all. I've talked to many, many people many, many times about the climate crisis and ecological crisis and also about many other topics, but I never cease to get nervous and it's always nerve wracking speaking to an entirely new group of people. So it's lovely, lovely to see you all. I'm flicking through the screen as we speak and I can see you all, a lot of you on your videos and giving me waves and smiling. So that's really, really lovely. Um, so I'd like to begin by just getting a sense of kind of who's here and, and, and what your <clears throat> awareness levels and kind of um, uh, knowledge levels, I guess, about the climate and ecological crisis and, and what's, what's really going on on the planet. Um, is there a way of muting the ding, the doorbell, the waiting room doorbell, do we know? Um, just before I sort of kick off properly. We know that if not it doesn't matter no i'm seeing some shape i don't know up. philippa is that possible can everyone hear it i'm guessing they can, they I, am can. Just yeah. I am just yeah, checking I'm, it's just slightly uh frazzling my brain my nervous brain i'm like ah it's the doorbell <laughs> <laughs> um anyway i'll carry on so yeah there we go <laughs> this keeps happening um okay so yeah, like I said, let's get a feel for kind of who's here and, and what kind of awareness base we already have already. Um, do, is, is that going to keep happening? Because I I'm going to find it quite challenging if it's I might just pause for a couple of minutes if, if there's going to be a few more people. Hi, I've put the information in the chat for how to turn the doorbell off. OK, so the information Thank you. I'll go find it now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm autistic, so um, sometimes if there's other things going on whilst I'm trying to focus on one thing, I literally just lose the plot. <laughs> so <laughs> forgive me if I just pause for a second. Um, okay, so as I was saying, um, to get a sense for who's here and to kind of all sort of check in a little bit, um, what I'm interested to know, first of all, is just to be clear, everybody's welcome, whatever your answers are to these questions in your own self or whatever you express is totally welcome but I'd like to just get a, a feel first of all for kind of people's awareness levels or sort of self-assessed awareness levels for what's going on on the planet in terms of the climate and ecological crisis so in Extinction Rebellion I'm a member of uh, well co-founder of Scientists for Extinction Rebellion and I'm not here necessarily as a, as a sort of um, Extinction Rebellion with my Extinction Rebellion hat on but in our online meetings we have a, a, um, a format which works quite well where people agree with something you kind of put your hands 
high up. If you're not really sure or sort of middling, you're there. And if you're mm -mm, not, not, not me, then we're down here. So I'd like to just start by asking, so in terms of awareness levels, what, how much you feel you already know um, about the climate and ecological crisis? Are you sort of a total expert? Have you been reading about it and hearing about it for a long time? Do you not know very much at all? Um, the sort of middling levels, or do you feel that you're sort of complete beginner? Um, you know, don't really know anything at all. So we've got some, we've got some middlings, we've got quite a few hands up, really nice. Um, lots of hands up and lots of, and lots of middles. Okay, so um, that's really great because that helps me to know sort of we've got a lot of people in, in, the, in, the, in the room, in the virtual room, who are already quite aware of what's going on in the planet. So for some people, some of what I say will be stuff that you know already Perhaps I'll frame it in a different way. Perhaps I'll give you different ways of thinking about it. Um, but hopefully for all of you, there will be stuff in here that's if not useful for you, then you, it, personally in terms of your own knowledge, then at least useful for how you might go about talking to people outside of your own little bubble about what's going on. So, so my next question then is those of you who, who were sort of, uh, let's say super aware, super knowledgeable, in fact, and the middles, how many of you, let's sort of put your hands up if you feel that you've got people in your life, people maybe in your inner circle, maybe colleagues, friends, who actually don't really seem to know as much as you do and certainly don't seem to be taking it as seriously. And that can lead to enormous frustration. So let's have hands up if that's, that's something that you experience in your life, in your in your day to day or in your work lives. And again, hands in the air if, if, if you've, you're feeling particularly frustrated or uh, annoyed, angry, overwhelmed by the fact that there are people in your life who perhaps you can't convince that it's as serious as you may perhaps know. Okay, so as I suspected, that's, that's most of us. So in those moments where when I'm speaking for the next hour or so, in those moments where you're feeling, oh, actually, I do know this already. Why are you having to tell me this? Oh, God, it's, it's just all so overwhelming. Come on, let's, let's get on to a discussion. See if you can absorb this in a way or experience this in a way of getting yourself some ammunition, some facts and figures, some evidence, some arguments to help to communicate and engage with those in your life who perhaps may not be as knowledgeable, may be a bit more skeptical, perhaps even ignorant or have been reading misinformation or all these kind of different reports. And the video will be available, I believe, afterwards. And I will also send Lucy a copy of my slides. So everything that's on the slides, all the facts and figures, you will get those. And I, you know, if you wanna use those, create your own talk out of it, show it to your friends and family, wonderful. Everything that I will be saying as well, um, everything in my presentation, the figures, the graphs, I'll show a few, but only, only a few, um, and all the kind of facts and information with huge amounts of, of, of more explanation and all the original sources are all in this online guide that Lucy mentioned called Emergency on Planet Earth, which I have written and put together with the Scientists for Extinction Rebellion community. It's been an enormous project, it's taken me about a year and a half, worked with a brilliant group of experts to compile all of this. Um, and I will be displaying a link at the end, plus hopefully Lucy perhaps might be able to share a link to that document afterwards. So please do use that, translate it into whatever language you want, <laughs> create, a, create resources from it, everything's in there. So um, anything you want to know from the talk, it, it hopefully you should find it all in that document. Um, and then just my third question to you all is, how are you feeling in yourself about how how you feel about what's going on on the planet in terms of how that's impacting you perhaps on a daily or weekly basis so again let's just get a feel for what's in the room so let's have a show of hands kind of again up here if this is really something that's really bothering you worrying you impacting you making you angry frustrated overwhelmed agitated on a daily basis and then down here if actually you know you're just sort of getting on with your life no judgment either way you know absolutely no judgment either way in terms of where you are so again, great, really lovely to see that we've got a really nice mixture, really nice spectrum of people in the space. Brilliant. Now I'm aware that people might be um, putting things in the comment box, uh, um, at the, in the chat box. As Lucy said, please feel, to free, feel free to do that throughout the talk. Um, if I happen to notice something, I might answer it in real time, but we'll certainly have time at the end. We've got lots of time at the end 
um, for me to try to address any questions that come up, but do pop them in the window as we go along, if nothing else, just so that we can kind of keep track of what we've got and, and what sorts of things people want to know. Forgive me if I don't notice them though in real time. Um, okay, brilliant. So before we start, given that we do have quite a lot of people who said that, you know, this is something that is, you know, activating you, making you feel perhaps scared, angry, frustrated, uh, anxious, overwhelmed, paralyzed, frustrated, uh, uh, numb, all of these things, these are all very valid, valid reactions to what's going on on the planet. So let's just start by taking a couple of deep breaths because I'm going to be sharing quite a lot of information. I talk quite fast. I'll try and slow things down. That's because when I get a bit nervous by being here, but also because of the nature of what I'm going to be sharing, I'll try to keep myself kind of calm. But it's inevitable that some of us might get a little bit kind of activated by what's going to be shared. So it's really important that we keep breathing, that we keep ourselves grounded. So we're going to start just um, by just doing a little bit of that first. So invite, I invite you to wherever, wherever you're sitting or standing or lying or curled up on the sofa, take a moment just to get yourself into a comfortable position, as comfortable as, as will, will, is, is allowed, or if you're standing up cooking dinner, yeah, that's all welcome to. And if possible, try and put both feet on the floor so that you've got some solid connection. If not, you know, a hand, your back, your bottom, something connecting with something solid or squishy. So you feel some connection with the earth beneath you. It may be many layers, many levels below your, the floor of your flat or your home. And let's just take a moment to really feel into, like feel the connection between the chair and your bottom, your feet and the floor, your back against the chair. Just see if you can really feel those parts of your body that are being held, that are being supported indirectly by the earth, by Mother Earth below us. So I invite you to close your eyes if you feel comfortable. You might want to put a hand onto a part of your body that might want to feel some comfort like your chest, your belly, perhaps your back or your shoulders. And we're just going to take a few deep breaths just to get present. So we're going to breathe in through the nose and we're going to breathe longer. We're going to breathe out through the mouth and we're going to spend longer on the out breath. Now this is actually a scientific method for calming down the nervous system. Very, very helpful at any point if we get feel, feel agitated or aroused. So we're going to breathe in for five through the nose, hold for two, and breathe out for seven through the mouth. We'll just do it a couple of times. So we breathe in, two, three, four, five, hold, two, out through the mouth, three, four, five, six, seven. And again, in, two, three, four, five, hold, two, and out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Lovely. And just one last time, really bring your awareness to your feet, to your bottom, to your back, everywhere that's held and safe in contact with the earth. Okay, and let's just take one deep breath all together. We're going to be do do a big deep breath in and then just sigh a big R on the out breath. Doesn't matter if you've got your volume on, your volume off. If you don't want to do that, that's fine as well. Let's admit Jeremy to the waiter room. Okay, big deep breath in and a big ah. Shake away your stress of the day or as much of it as you can. Maybe give your shoulders a little wriggle. Maybe give your back a little wriggle. Okay. So now, I first got involved with awareness of the climate and ecological crisis actually relatively recently. Now I'm a science communicator. I've got a, um, <laughs> you're welcome Ben. Um, I've got a degree in natural sciences from Cambridge University. I've got a PhD in cancer research. I also trained as an actress and singer, spent many years working as a professional performer, also worked as a maths and science teacher. And I now work as a science communicator writing books about science, giving talks, appearing on TV and radio, and also training scientists to be able to communicate about what they do. So I've been involved in the world of science my whole life. However, when I first went along to the first Extinction Rebellion protest that I went to, which was actually the second protest uh, in April, 2019, 
I went along basically knowing very, very little about what was going on on the planet. Now that in itself, you might think, well, that's kind of a bit odd. Well, that's kind of the point is that a year and a half ago, not very much was known to the public, let, uh, to, the, to, to me as a scientist, let alone to the public about what was going on with the planet. So the reason I went to the protest was not because I was worried about the planet, was actually to support my partner, Kim Wei, who's actually on this Zoom call somewhere. Kim Wei, give us a wave very shy, um, who was playing in the Samba band. So I'm going to start sharing my slides. Um, uh, how do I do this? Share screen. I always get very muddled with technology, believe it or not. Um, okay, share screen, share screen, slide view. So you should now be able to see if you move your um, video, little picture videos, square videos to the side or to the bottom so that you can see the full screen that's quite important, particularly the right hand side of your screen, because um, some of the graphs are important on that side. All right, so I went along in April 2019, uh, Extinction Rebellion protests in central London, and I went along to support my partner, Kim Wei, who was play oops, who was playing in the Samba band. And I was watching him drumming and I was watching him, uh, Kim Wei's non-binary uh, non trans, his pronouns are he, him. Um, and Kim Wei was uh, drumming in the samba band, brilliant samba band leader, and was also singing songs on the pink boat in the middle of Oxford Circus. Um, so apart from thinking it was a quite exciting spectacle and all good fun, obviously it's not fun what it was about, but it was quite a quite a exhilarating thing to be part of. But I was looking around and I was seeing all these sort of protesters with their, their slogans and their banners and their signs saying, you know, um, societal collapse, mass extinction, civil unrest, um, uh, millions of people could die. And I was think, looking around going, oh my God, really? Like, this is a bit full on, this is a bit OTT. Like, mm, I know climate change is happening. Like I learned about it at school and I'm not stupid. You know, I know it's a bad thing, but surely this is a bit extreme. Surely this is a bit alarmist, as I'm sure a lot of people have thought about the Extinction Rebellion protests. And so, you know, I, with my integrity as, as a good science communicator, I was like, well, I don't want to sort of people to know that I'm at this protest because, you know, really, surely this can't be as bad as this. And I thought there's three good reasons that I could think of why surely it couldn't be this bad. Number one is that if it were that bad, surely climate change, ecosystem loss would be on the front page of every newspaper. It would be top of the bill on every news report. We'd be hearing about it left, right and centre. That is the media's responsibility to make sure we knew. Hmm. Naive I was. Um, number two, I thought, OK, if it were really this bad, then the people in charge, the government, the grown ups, dare I say it, surely they would be doing something about it. Surely, like, we shouldn't be worried because they'll, they've got it under control. Again, you know, there I was in my early 40s, very naive, you know, thinking that that is a good reason to think that this couldn't be true. Perhaps I was just so horrified at the idea that it could be. But thirdly, and, and more importantly, well, not more importantly, actually less importantly, is that, as I said, in my own integrity as a science communicator, I've spent decades communicating science to the public, being asked to speak out on important issues, including feminism and advocacy and, and, and issues that are affecting the world, women in science. And I've never been asked to speak about climate change have now but at that point I was like this hasn't isn't something that's come across my awareness as I said earlier I'm autistic my whole my whole uh, ethos in life is to get to the truth to understand the truth to communicate the truth and to make sure that people know the truth and I was like well you know it, it's not something I've massively kind of caught on to so you know surely it can't be true again naive as I was that that was my feeling about it so what I decided to do as any good citizen would do, hopefully, who's going along to something like that, to say, well, okay, for my own peace of mind, I want to find out as much as I can about what's going on on the planet and find out if this is indeed true, if actually this is what's going on. And, you know, given that I have trained as a scientist, I've got a PhD, I know how to research, you know, I knew which papers to go to, I knew which websites to look at. Obviously, most people in the public don't have you know, this benefit of this knowledge, but I knew which experts to talk to. I knew how to gather information and how to know what was real and what, what wasn't real. And the more I read, the more I learned, the more horrified and terrified I started to become. Because what became clear is that not only were the things 
on written on these banners and shouted by the activists, not only were those things that they were saying true, but actually things were, if anything, a lot, lot worse. And I started to feel this sense of dread. And I can honestly say that since that day, I have not had a single good night's sleep since. So as this started, there's this sort of horrifying sense and of feeling in myself started to unfold. Um, I started to think, well, there's nothing in my life anymore that has any integrity to it other than really getting involved with bringing my skills, my passion, the things that I already do in this world to raising awareness and spreading awareness about, uh, about climate change and the ecological crisis. So the first thing that I did as I um, got involved with Extinction Rebellion, and I'll come back to that at the end of my presentation. Um, and I, as part of that, I joined with a, a team of climate scientists and ecologists who were already wanting to get on the streets and raise, raise awareness. And uh, together, we've spent the last year and a half, like I said, creating this, this as, as far as we think it is, the kind of uh, easy to read, uh, go-to resource for anything you might want to know about what's going on on the planet called Emergency on Planet Earth. And what I'm going to present now are some of, a sort of an overview of the information in that resource with some uh, diagrams and graphs and, and I'll talk you through it and I'll hopefully make it re really super, super simple. And like I said, if you know some of this already, what I really want to be doing here is equipping you with the information that you might need in order to combat all of those common arguments used by skeptics, used by deniers, used by um, people who just are a bit too scared to address what's going on to say, oh, it's not real, oh, it's not really happening. And please, as we go through, if there's anything I say that isn't clear, or if there's anything I say that you think, yeah, but I've heard somebody say that actually that bit's not true, or actually there's a study that shows blah, 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 please tell them to me. I won't necessarily know all the answers, but I have spent a year and a half deeply diving into this and trying to get to the bottom of all of this. And I can honestly say, hand on my heart, that all of, the, all of that stuff that's like, oh, but it's not true. Oh, but this study shows this. Oh, but this scientist said this. Most of it's not true, or it's said by people who are backed by fossil fuel companies, or it's outdated, you know, there's a lot of arguments as to why what I'm going to present to you here is actually the definitive information as to what's going on on the planet. Now, as I start to share, let's just see where we are now. Um, as I start to share, I'm just going to stop sharing my screen for one moment because I just want to um, bring awareness once more to the fact that this information can be quite challenging to receive. Now, some of you might be aware that when we have uh, stress in our environment or around us, it can activate a part of our, our nervous system called the stress response. So in response to stress, particularly if it's potentially life-threatening, which for some of us, many of us, perhaps future generations, perhaps already is, or certainly might well be in the future, then it can activate us. You might feel your heart rate starting to to rise, you might start your breathing, uh, might, might feel your breathing starting to go a little bit faster. You might find that your mouth's getting a bit dry. Um, you might feel a bit sweaty. That's very natural and very normal. So I just invite you to keep breathing and to keep kind of landing back into your body. I also invite you to be aware that you might be having some kind of intellectual or emotional responses. So some of us, when we receive scary or overwhelming information, we go into our fight response. So you might feel angry and frustrated and irritated and like, oh God, I wish you'd stop telling me all this horrible stuff or, oh God, you know, I need to just get out on the streets and take action or go and tell my dog off for eating the sofa because we're just so annoyed and so angry. Um, that's, that's very natural and that's our fight response. Another thing that might happen is that we might get activated into our flight response. So you might to feel, start to feel um, lots of other thoughts creeping in, like, oh, I've left the iron on, or I need to go and cook dinner, or um, very, very fast, or I need to do this and this and this to help, and having lots of different ideas and feeling quite agitated. And that's us sort of preparing to run from the crisis, right? the antelope preparing to run away from a lion, as opposed to the antelope fighting the lion and getting angry. But a third response, which a lot of people don't know about in the stress response, is called, so there's two Fs, fight, flight, but there's also a third F, which is called freeze. And I really invite you to notice, because this is the most common, actually, in my experience reaction to hearing about the climate and ecological crisis, is to have a uh, more of a freeze response, which is a sort of sense of overwhelm, a sense of numbness, perhaps. Sometimes it can be quite a pleasant feeling, just sort of checking out, spacey, daydreaming. 
or it could be a sense of, frust uh, of a sort of shutdown, of a sort of brain freeze, of a sort of overwhelm, of a sort of paralysis, of a sort of, oh, it's all too much. I just need to go and hide under my duvet and just, I can't even think straight. I don't even know what to do with myself. And that again is very common. So if that, if that arises, again, take some breaths, it's very natural, it's very normal. You might have noticed all of these responses in people around you or activists on the street. Um, so again, I invite you just to breathe. You're welcome to mute me at any point if you just need to check out for a bit, go and have a cup of tea um, and just bring yourself back to kind of, again, feeling yourself on the floor, taking some deep breath longer on the out breath and tune back in as and when you want to. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my slides. Uh, as for a scientist, I have a very bizarre terror of technology. <laughs> um, okay, so where have we got to? So I'd like to start by just talking about what is actually going on right now. None of this future prediction stuff. Let's just start with today. So right now, you, you may well be aware that the last um, four years have been the hottest years on record. This is just a map of the world. <laughs> Yes, it's a map of the world. Sorry, stupid thing to say, Emily. Uh, this is a map of the world showing how um, the, the changes in temperature over the last sort of 10 years or so. And this just shows very clearly that across the globe, there, the temperature has, it is hotter in most areas than the average over compared to the period of time before. Um, another, why is that not clicking on? Okay, now another representation of this is that this actually shows uh, years over the last 150 years. So I'm gonna talk a lot about since the beginning of the industrial revolution. So it's around 1850s, but maybe a bit before. So over the last 150 years, you can see really clearly here, the colors represent the, the temperature that it, it has got hotter. So like I said, the last four years have been the hottest on record. 19 of the hottest 20 years have been in the last 20 years. Um, the, in 2019, more than nearly 400 temperature records were broken across the globe. I mean, that's staggering. July 2019 was the hottest month ever recorded. There's now a pretty good chance that this year, 2020, is actually going to be the hottest year ever recorded. Um, January 2020 was the warmest January ever recorded. The list goes on. So there's no doubt that the world is getting hotter. Now, if we put this into context, you're going to need to see the very right hand side of the screen for this and for some of the next diagrams. Oh, oops. So I'm just going to minimize us for a minute. Um, Lucy, if you can just let me know if there's any questions that come in that seem directly relevant. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. That'd be cool. Because uh, I can't see the chat now or, or any, any people. <laughs> Actually, that's very disconcerting. I'm going to not do that. That's far too disconcerting put you over there okay so um if we take this in context so this graph shows the last uh 2000 years and you can see almost to the very right hand end if you look down at the bottom invention of the steam engine that's um beginning ish of the industrial revolution and you can see that since then last 150 years temperature really has shot up now our temperatures are now about one degree higher than they were at the start of the industrial revolution one degree might not sound like very much however first of all one degree is the difference between water and ice. Secondly, one degree, when you average it over the entire globe, is the equivalent to four atomic bombs worth of heat energy going into our atmosphere every second. Because the globe is that big, that, that ha that's how much heat energy it takes to raise the overall average temperature by just one degree. Now, of course, some areas are getting hotter. The poles are getting far hotter than the average, um, than the global average. Some areas are even getting a little bit colder, but that, so that doesn't mean that climate change isn't happening because on average, the world is getting hotter. And if you average that out um, year upon year, that is absolutely unequivocally what is happening. Now, the question is, why is the earth getting hotter? So again, forgive me if you know all of this stuff, a little bit of basic climate science here. So first of all, can we be sure that this increase in temperature, which leads to changes in the climate, is to do with humans? So the answer is yes, it is absolutely unequivocal. How do we know this? So the way we know this is because carbon dioxide, as well as methane, nitrous oxide, and some other um, chemicals that you find in the atmosphere are greenhouse gases. Now, greenhouse gases, a lot of people have heard of them, 
many people don't actually know quite what it means. Greenhouse gases are basically a layer of gases around the Earth's atmosphere, around the Earth, sorry, in the Earth's atmosphere, that form like a fluffy blanket around the Earth. They basically keep us warm at night. Without greenhouse gases, we'd all be too cold at night and, and none of us would be able to survive here. So this nice fluffy blanket has been kept in place uh, by the carbon cycle. So carbon dioxide, for example, is added to the blanket and removed from the blanket by trees, by humans, by animals. And it's been kept in place pretty constant for uh, at least since the beginning of civilization. It's gone up and down a little bit, um, but it's been pretty constant. Um, however, due to human actions, our fluffy blanket is getting thicker. We're adding more of these greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. The blanket's getting a little bit thicker, which means that more heat radiating from the surface of the earth that originally came from the sun, um, heating up the earth, is trapped in our atmosphere. So our atmosphere heats up. Now, some people say, well, okay, maybe our atmosphere is heating up because of uh, changes in the sun, changes in solar activity. But as you can see on this graph, actually solar activity goes up and down. But if you look at the temperature of the earth, that is very much going up. Some people say it's volcanic activity. Again, many studies have now shown that all of the impacts other than greenhouse gases have an absolutely neg negligible effect on global temperatures. In contrast, greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, which is um, the one shown here, have been going up exactly mirroring or reflecting the changes in global temperatures. So we know it's greenhouse gases. So in fact, if we look over the last 800,000 years, we can see, again, you'll need to see the right-hand side of the screen, we can see that carbon dioxide levels here, this is 2018, they're still going up, are higher than any time in the last 800,000 years. And in fact, they're higher than any time in the last 3 million years. Over the last 800,000 years, we've cycled in and out of ice ages, um, which is what you can see in the graph here. Some of that has been driven, at least in part, by changes in carbon dioxide levels due to the Earth's natural cycles, due to changes in the way the Earth orbits around the sun, which is again, another classic argument used by deniers. Um, those natural changes in orbit have driven some of the ice ages and have driven some of the changes in carbon dioxide levels naturally. However, if you look at the graph, we're actually supposed to be heading down towards our next ice age. We shouldn't be going up. We're only going up because of human changes. And we're going up far, in terms of carbon dioxide, far, far faster than any previous natural change. Hundreds of times faster, certainly in the last 800,000 years. So, by natural, by the natural uh, cycles, we ought to be cruising towards our next ice age, not shooting up as we are today. And in fact, to just combat any last deniers uh, arguments, um, there's now been shown a human fingerprint on climate change where they can actually look at the atoms of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They can show that it's come from human action. They can show that that carbon dioxide is what is causing heating of the atmosphere. So what kind of human actions release carbon dioxide? Well, first of all, burning of fossil fuels, which has been happening hugely, huge amounts since the Industrial Revolution. Secondly, cutting down of trees, because trees are natural stores of carbon. When you burn trees due to deforestation, the carbon dioxide is released back into the atmosphere. Uh, thirdly, plowing up of soils. The soils release carbon dioxide that's been stored in the soils back into the atmosphere. Um, also, uh, farming, so paddy fields release methane, which is a greenhouse gas, so growing rice. Um, farming uh, livestock, so sheep and cows. Cows burp out huge amounts of methane into the atmosphere, enormous amounts. Um, and then we've got nitrous oxide, another greenhouse gas, very potent greenhouse gas, that's released from fertilizers, so particularly uh, chemical fertilizers used during intensive agricultural. Uh, techniques and also from uh, animal waste, animal manure releases nitrous oxide. So that is what's thickening our fluffy blanket and making us get warmer and warmer. And in fact, there is countless evidence from all top scientists saying that it is our actions, human actions, that are changing our climate so extensively that we are now entering um, out of the Holocene into what's now known as the Anthropocene period of climate that is caused anthro by humans. So oh, where have we got to? So okay, what is going to happen as a result? Well, what is happening, let's say, first of all, as a result of all this extra heat energy in our atmosphere? So the first thing is that obviously the climate's going to change. We get more extreme weather. 
First thing that we're going to see, of course, is more extreme heat because the average increase is one degree, but that's going to be a lot, a lot higher in parts of the certain parts of the world. So we're going to see, we are seeing um, extreme heat waves in different parts of the world. We're seeing prolonged heat waves. And where it's hotter, we're also going to see, obviously, if it's hotter, it's also going to be drier. There's going to be less rainfall. So in those parts of the world where it's already hot, it's going to get even hotter. It is getting hotter. We're getting less rainfall. We're getting droughts. We're getting forest fires where the land is drying out, where you've got conditions that are much more conducive to the spreading of forest fires, even those ones that might be caused by arson or by other means, which a lot there's a lot of debunking around that, by the way. But even though they're still spread a lot, lot, lot faster due to the dry, uh, the dry air, the hot air and the dried out soils. So that's not rocket science. That's kind of pretty clear that that's what's happening, um, as well as uh, hotter areas getting hotter. We're, we're also, when we've got more moisture, sorry, when we've got more heat in the atmosphere, you're going to get more evaporation of water from the oceans. That's going to lead to more moisture in the atmosphere, more water vapor in the atmosphere, and that is what's happening. Also, warm air actually holds more water vapor. What that means is that when that water vapor eventually rises high enough or gets cold enough in order to condense to form clouds, you're going to get much um, when those eventually then get colder and fall as rain, you're going to get much heavier rain, you're going to get much more rain, and you're going to get really extreme and intense floods and storms in areas that are already wet, hot and wet, or cold and wet areas. So we're not just getting hot areas and, and, and uh, hot and dry areas, we're getting cold, wet areas, well, not cold, on average a bit hotter, but we're getting damp, wet floods and storms, particularly in tropical areas. In addition, um, scientists now think that the changes to the, the amount of heat in the Earth's atmosphere is actually messing up the jet stream, which you might know is responsible for our weather systems. Um, and the messing up of the jet stream is thought to be making it a bit more curvy, which basically means that weather patterns, instead of passing through areas, they linger longer. So not only do we get dry spells and really, really intensely dry spells, but we, they last for longer, hot, dry spells. We also like we've had the heat, heat waves this summer and the, all the summers before. Uh, we also, when we do get uh, storms and floods and flash floods, they last for longer because those, those weather patterns linger over those areas. So it's pretty clear that we're going to get more extreme weather, that we're getting more extreme weather. And in fact, the uh, climate related disasters have doubled since the 1990s. There have been over 200 attribution studies now, um, which have shown that the vast majority of extreme weather events have been made more either a bit or extremely more likely and therefore more frequent due to climate change. And some heat waves have now been shown to have been impossible without climate change or to have been made up to 100 times more likely because of climate change. So this is happening. Same with forest fires, same with hurricanes, same with floods, same with droughts, same with monsoons, same with tropical storms. Um, this is happening. It's already happening. It's already impacting um, millions of people in uh, more developing countries where the weather is already more extreme and, and hotter. Uh, and it's, it's certainly starting to impact us here in the UK. Um, and let's be clear, it is going to get a lot, lot worse. These records are going to be broken. Um, we're going to see more extreme fires. We're going to see more extreme hurricanes like Hurricane Harvey's in the future. Um, and it's pretty clear that not only is it going to get worse, but you know, we could say, OK, well, we're lucky. We live in places where we can have air conditioning, where we can live on stilts, we can live up a hill. You know, but the, the, the poorer people in parts of the world are already suffering. And anything that impacts other parts of the world now is certainly going to impact us in richer parts of the world as time goes by. And I'll talk about um, knock on effects and how, how we're all interrelated in a little bit. So it's clear that we need to be listening to the people who are already now suffering from the extreme climate related events that we're already seeing. But it's not just climate that is impacted by this extra heat in our atmosphere. So another big uh, impact area is the melting of ice and the rising of seas. Now it's really clear that along with temperature rises, sea levels have been rising. Again, it's not rocket science, of course they have, because first of all, when temperatures rise, ice melts. Now, if ice melts in floating ice, uh, so-called sea ice, then that itself doesn't change the sea level. But what it does do is massively impact 
the habitats, the hunting grounds of creatures who depend on floating sea ice, such as polar bears, the, the poster child of climate change, um, seals who are massively impacted by losing the ice that they, that they, that they live on and that they hunt on. But to make the matters worse, if ice melts on land, so land sheets like Antarctica and Greenland, if that ice melts, then that, uh, and also glaciers, if that melts, it runs off into the sea and causes the sea levels to rise. Not to mention the fact that again, glaciers and ice sheets are the habitats of many creatures. And in fact, there are 1.9 billion people across the globe who depend on glaciers for their fresh water, for drinking and for crops and for irrigation. So that the meltwater not only is a problem in its own right, but also runs off into the seas, the sea levels go up, plus hot water, actually expands. So as the oceans get hotter because of the heat in the atmosphere, they take up more space. Again, that's why sea levels rise. And what we're seeing is that these impacts are already affecting people across the world, and it's going to have a much more devastating impact as we go on, on coastal communities, people living around rivers. Um, and there's many parts of, of the UK that are predicted by 2050 to be below the, the high water level at high tide, certainly at least once a year. And there's some very terrifying maps that you can look at to show, you know, unless enough flood defences are built and at the moment it doesn't look like that's going to happen, then there will be massive, massive problems. Um, and again, we're talking at the moment about things that are currently happening. So damage to ocean life directly from climate change, I'm talking right now, as opposed to overfishing and pollution, which is a whole nother ball game. Damage to ocean life, as the oceans warm, we get heat waves, literally marine heat waves sweeping through the ocean and killing marine life. Also, as the oceans warm, oxygen dissolved in the oceans becomes less soluble. Oxygen is required for life, for fish, uh, for sea creatures to respire, to take in oxygen. And we're getting more and more ocean dead zones, areas of low oxygen where sea creatures can't live. Um, in addition, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the greenhouse gas dissolves in the ocean and makes the oceans a little bit less alkaline, a little bit more acidic. And that ac acidity um, causes the shells of sea creatures to start to dissolve. So sea snails, uh, clams, oysters, coral starts to dissolve because of the extra acidity in the ocean. And that is having a devastating impact already on coral reefs and on many, many sea snails, sea creatures. And of course, these are not just tiny creatures in the ocean. They are the bottom of the food chain that all the other creatures depend on. And there's actually a billion people across the globe that depend on coral reefs for their livelihood, for shelter from storms, um, for tourism, um, uh, for, for many different for many different reasons. So we've also got to look at the knock on effects of climate change. Now, this is a bit of a scary diagram, but this is just to give you an overall feel for the fact that climate change is not an isolated incidence of, of just changing, changing our weather and, and, and changing the heat on the planet. It has a knock on effect on many, many things. And I'm just going to mention a couple of these things in a, in a little bit more detail. But of course, there's a lot more I could say here. So firstly, food and water scarcity. Now, climate change alone is causing, like I said, extreme weather events. Floods, storms, droughts are bound to have a knock-on effect on the ability to grow food. And that is already happening. We're already seeing in uh, heat waves that there is uh, impacts on, on crops. There's many examples of that. Uh, I go into a lot of detail on those in the Emergency on Planet Earth document if you want some examples, there, there's tons in there. Uh, floods make it harder to grow, um, to grow land crops and to use land for farming. And that's already happening here in the UK. So inevitably, anything that's happening across another part of the world is going to have a knock-on effect on uh, this country and other parts of the world as well. We import 50% of our food, actually probably a bit more, 70 to 80% of our fruit and vegetables. So whether or not floods are affecting us here, if they're affecting other countries, then the knock-on effect is that it's gonna um, lead to food scarcity in this country and increases in food prices, etc. We also already talked about water scarcity, droughts, uh, melting glaciers, you know, these are the sorts of effects that climate change is already have, happening. Um, 
a lot of people don't realize about the impacts on health. You know, there's a lot of data now to show that pandemics are made far more likely due to the mixing of animals with humans due to the destruction of habitats, which I'll come to. Also, animals are moving, they're migrating because of the changes in temperature, because of the changes in seasons, because of climate change. They're coming into more contact with each other, coming into more contact with humans. Diseases are spreaded, spreading from animal to animal and from animal to human. Also, at increasing temperatures, uh, the bacteria that cause infectious diseases and diarrhea are more likely to thrive. Therefore, infectious diseases become more likely and more likely to spread. Um, and there are other fears such as melting ice, uh, exposing pathogens that haven't been uh, around before. Um, and of course, it's the children and the elderly that are already disproportionately affected by this. Um, it is, health is a huge, huge issue with climate change. Um, and in fact, you know, it's pretty clear now that climate change is not just an emergency for, um, our, for our crops, it's also a medical emergency. Um, we've also got mass displacement, a record 7 million people in the, in the first six months of 2019, 7 million people were displaced from their homes because of climate change. And this is only going to get worse. So these are just some of the knock on effects of the, the extra heat in our atmosphere. So then we also need to add into the picture what else we're doing to our planet, not just burning fossil fuels and burping, burping cows and, and fertilizer and, and what else are we doing? So I already mentioned deforestation. Um, the, there's parts of the Brazilian rainforest, uh, the Amazon rainforest in Brazil, that are currently being felled at the rate of three football fields every minute. You know, that's how much rainforest we're losing. Now, not only, as I've mentioned, does that mean that we haven't got as much forest to hold the carbon from the atmosphere, we're then releasing that carbon back into the atmosphere. Plus, that means we're losing habitats for animals, I'll come on to animals in a minute. Plus, we're also losing protection of the soil, protection from floods, sources of medicines, um, so many things that trees are required for, needed for by us. And they're also, um, uh, they provide uh, shelter for other animals that then also feed on up, a, up the food chain as well. So it's really important that we take into account the, the huge damage that's being done to the rainforest by humans. And these all feed into each other, climate change, deforestation, all the other things I'm about to talk about, they all kind of feed in and, and uh, they're kind of interlinked. So we've then got intensive agriculture, which I briefly mentioned already. So like I said, churning up the soil uh, releases, it damages the soil, uh, releases some of the carbon that's stored in the soil. So actually increasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's leading to even more warming, which is leading to even more drying out of the soils. It's like a vicious cycle goes round and round. Um, intensive agriculture is also using up an awful lot of our land that um, we, we really need to be using for other sources. Um, it in itself is releasing a lot of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. There's many reasons why intensive agriculture is not the way forward. Monoculture, you know, using the land for just one crop at a time, that's a huge damage to biodiversity, which means the, the diverse array of creatures that can live on those uh, in those fields. Um, and then we've got the compaction of the land by the tractors. We've got compaction of the land by animals. Um, animals are a particular issue. 80% um, of our farmland is used for livestock, but it only produces less than 20% less than of our calories. It's a hugely inefficient way to use land, and it only produces about a third of our protein. Also, a third of our croplands are being used to grow crops to feed those animals. If we use those, those croplands to grow crops to feed us, and we got our protein from beans and, and um, legumes and stuff, then that would be a far, far more efficient way to use the land, and it would be far less damaging in terms of greenhouse gases. Um, it's pretty clear now that if we're going to um, reduce the damage to our planet, we're going to need to be eating a lot less meat and dairy. Um, so then there's pollution. There's pollution in our waters. There's pollution in our air. Um, for nearly 5 million people a year die prematurely as a result of outside air pollution. Nine out of 10 people on this planet breathe polluted air. And this is not just a problem in India and China. Um, 24 people every day die in London as a, prematurely as a result of outside air pollution. Um, this is a huge, huge issue. And the majority of that air pollution is from the burning of fossil fuels, from car exhaust and from factories. And then we've got wildlife loss. I've already mentioned that a couple of times briefly, but that in itself needs its kind of its own focus really, is that 
wildlife is hugely important to us. It's not just beautiful, it's not just something that we enjoy looking at, but it, it underpins the fabric of life. And due to a combination of climate change, of habitat loss, of pollution, we are now, uh, it's actually, this, this figure has now changed um, just in, in very recent months. Um, we're now down about 68% of vertebrate populations since the 1970s. And this is absolutely staggering, you know, this loss of this loss of creatures. One in four species are at risk of extinction. Um, and it's estimated that over the next, uh, over the coming uh, decades, that one million more species are at risk of extinction. Many of those um, imminently in the next few decades. And, and this is, like I said, it's not just about creatures being, you know, just as much right to live on our planet as we have and we're getting rid of them but actually we depend on these creatures of particular concern are insects. Insects are the very sort of underpinning the fabric of our life so huge uh, reason for that is that insects are pollinators. 95% of what we eat relies on um, fertile soil and um, the soil is already being ploughed up by intensive agriculture. We've now lost about a third of the fertile soils in terms of they've been damaged or degraded and that in itself is making it harder to grow crops but when you add into that the fact that we're losing our insects our pollinators that's becoming even harder for crops to grow so for example bees are on the list of creatures that are threatened with extinction and bees carry out the majority of crop pollination so without insects and bees uh, it's going to be much harder to grow crops. Plus, we're losing small creatures like earthworms. We've lost 80% of earthworms, and it's earthworms that usually replenish the soil and allow uh, crops to grow on even damaged soils. And of course, now the soils are damaged and they can't be replenished. Um, another big problem in terms of uh, loss of creatures is, is loss of creatures in the oceans. Now, I already talked about ocean heat waves and uh, lack of oxygen and the acidity, but it's also to do with pollution and overfishing. So we're, we're it's a huge concern that we're running out of fish in the sea, not just to eat, but as the bottom of the food chain for other creatures. We also depend on big creatures, for example, elephants, uh, which are um, hugely declining in numbers in some areas. They act as forest gardeners. So they trim away some of the smaller shrubs in forests so that the bigger trees can grow better so that they can trap more carbon. Uh, we've also got things like whales who are, that are also uh, on the extinction list, on some extinction lists, and uh, numbers are decreasing. Oils actually, when oils, whales, when they dive down deep in the ocean, they bring up nutrients from below when they surface to breathe, to blow through their air hole. Air hole and phytoplankton, little sea, uh, sea plants on the surface of the ocean, they, they need those nutrients to grow. Those then form the bottom of the food chain and they also trap carbon from the atmosphere. So, you know, without some of these bigger creatures, it's, it's you know, we, we depend on everything. You know, ecosystems are like a giant game of Jenga and it, you take a couple of pieces out, not necessarily just from the bottom and everything could, could to come tumbling down. And in fact, we're losing, it's not just how many creatures we're losing, but it's how fast we're losing them. And we're losing them so fast that scientists are now saying that we're entering the sixth mass extinction in terms of how quickly we're losing species. Um, extinctions have happened in the past, a long, long, long time ago, but this time it's our fault. And so much so that we are, our nature is declining at, at rates up to a thousand times faster than nature or species ought to be going extinct in terms of the background rate. And of course, because the climate is changing so fast, that's why creatures are, are uh, going extinct before they're able to adapt to the changes in climate. And also they're uh, dying out because a lot of the land that the creatures might try to migrate to in order to migrate somewhere cooler, they might go to higher altitudes, they might go to further north or further south, but those areas are now so damaged and degraded by human action that creatures have nowhere to go. And the, these ecosystems are just crucial to our life. You know, uh, they're the very foundation of our economies, our livelihoods, our food security, our health and our quality of life. So it's really important that we realize that what we're doing to nature, the ecological crisis, is just as important as what we're doing to our climate in terms of the climate crisis. So, a lot of scary information there. Let's move on uh, to talking about where we're heading, you know, what is going to happen next. Now, current predictions, we now remember about one, one degree hotter than at the start of the Industrial Revolution. Current predictions are that we're going to head, we're going to be hitting about one and a half degrees hotter than the Industrial Revolution by about 2030. And in fact, we're going to be hitting two degrees hotter on our current trajectories 
even taking into account the changes that are already being made by about 2050. Now that is completely ridiculous because according to the Paris Agreement, global governments made a promise that we were going to bring our carbon emissions down or to net zero by 2050 in order to try to absolutely guarantee that our temperature rise won't go above two degrees post-industrial levels. But actually we're heading for two degrees at 2050. We're nowhere close to meeting this target. We're heading for 1.5 degrees by uh, 2030. And by the end of the century, we're heading for a staggering three degrees. Some suggestions, some emissions pathways, depending on exactly how the earth uh, is impacted by our greenhouse gas emissions. It's a very inexact science predicting exactly what temperature rise we're going to get to. But the, um, the average prediction is three degrees by the end of the century, but with a, a good a good likelihood, a good possibility of actually hitting four degrees by the end of the century. Even if we take into account all the policies in place, if we take into account all the pledges and targets, we're still he head heading close to three degrees. That is completely ludicrous. Um, and this just shows that even under the sort of relatively lower end of the emissions pathway, so that's all the sort of pink, pinky ones, all of those show that we're still heading to over three degrees by the end of the century. Those bottom ones are mitigation pathways, so-called if we kind of actually, actually stop emitting carbon at, at rates that we're absolutely nowhere close to doing. And just to put this in context, remember that spike that we see on the right there, that's us at one degree above pre-industrial levels. We're talking another two degrees on top of that by the end of the century. We're talking one degree on top of that by 2050. So what's that actually going to do to this planet? Now, the best way I found to be able to share this with you is actually to show you a very short video that's just been released by the World Economic Forum. Now, I hope you're gonna be able to see this video if I share it on here. Let's see. Now, if this doesn't work for any reason, Lucy, you're gonna to have to let me know. Oh. It's got sound, no image. Oh, sounds no image. Yeah, I think you have to stop sharing your other um, presentation. And oh, then, resume the share. Yeah, you have to stop sharing and then reshare the video. I see. Okay, thank you for that. Not done this bit before. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing that. Okay, right, got it. Then I'm going to start sharing share screen um hang on let me just get it back to the beginning is that is that now working is that working yes brilliant
Okay, hold on, I just need to stop that playing one second. Oof, okay, that's a lot to take in. Let me go back to sharing my presentation. Okay, so I just want to add, if you'll indulge me, even just a few more things that weren't in that video, just to really to really get a feel for, for where we're heading. And I remember this is where we're heading right now with the policies in place, but if we don't take further action, I need to just really make clear here that this it's possible to change this. A lot of people say it's too late, it's too late, it's locked in. There is contention over this, but as far as the best understanding that I'm aware of in terms of the scientific community, the scientists, the climate scientists, it is possible to change this, but we have to take action now. So some more, a little few more uh, bits of information. So by the 20, 2050s, extreme heat is going to become a real, real problem um, in many, many parts of the world. Water scarcity is going to become a real problem in many parts of the world give you just a second to have a look at those. I already mentioned the melting glaciers earlier. Five billion people lacking sufficient water. Food scarcity is likely to be a big problem in the future, in 20, around 2050s. Agricultural yields potentially down by 30%. Five billion people facing food shortages. Mass displacement will get worse. People will have to leave their homes. Hundreds of millions of people, because of a combination of rising seas and storms, uh, will be living in areas that will be flooded at least once a year. So they will have to move or build better defences. And you know that kind of infrastructure, certainly in a lot of parts of the world, is just not going to be possible. So with all of these impacts, coming full circle to what I said at the start about these slogans, Extinction Rebellion, at the protests that were saying, you know, societal collapse, civil unrest, um, uh, loss of life, you know, none of this is a certainty. We don't know what's going to happen, but with all the impacts that have just been mentioned in the film and here, surely it's pretty clear that where we're heading to could lead to really quite, quite catastrophic impacts, even by about 2050. Now, by the end of the century, as was mentioned, it looks like we're heading for about three degrees. It's also possible that we could get to four degrees, about probably about a one in 20 chance at the moment we could get to four degrees. And just to give you a, a really feel of just how terrible that is, amongst climate scientists, amongst people who actually know what that means, there's a growing sense of panic about a four degree world. Panic about the whole world, not just on a personal level. Um, there's a widespread view that this four degree world would be incompatible with reasonable characterization of an organized, equitable and civilized global community. A lot of jargon there, but I'm sure you can see what that means. A four degree world, it's been said that a four degree world may not be able to accommodate the eight billion people alive today, or even half of that. We're heading for about 11 billion, you know, if lots of people don't die by then, by the end of the century. So that's a lot less people than this world is supposed to be having by that point. And there's no certainty that we can adapt to it. We can't just say, okay, let's, let's, let's keep on going and see where we get to and see how we kind of can cope with it. There's no certainty that adaptation is going to be possible. We simply cannot allow it to occur. The UN very recently stated that the earth would become an uninhabitable hell for millions of people unless, climate, unless leaders begin to confront the climate crisis with urgency. And Lord Nicholas Stern has been quoted to say that we risk damages on a scale larger than the two world wars of the last century. Hundreds of, of millions, probably billions of people would have to, to move. So this is an emergency. And I just wanna let you, I know there's, there's been a lot of scary information here, but I just want to reassure you that this is a view that's shared by a lot of different types of people from different expert areas. So I'll just let you have a little look on that. Again, if it's too much information, just, just feel free to zone out at any point. But this is not just an opinion. This is information that's been shared by NASA, by heads of climate institutes, by uh, heads of human, human health, uh, the UN, economists. We've also got on this list IPCC writers, uh, UN rights, Mark Carney, former governor of the Bank of England, um, security experts, 
and even the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Pope has also made some very powerful statements about this. Okay, so what do we need to do? Final part of the presentation and then we will answer questions and um, we can have a discussion about this. So what do we actually need to do? Well, what's important to realize is that we can still act. It is not too late. All of this horrifying information, we can still do something about this, but not for much longer. For a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5 degrees heating, where it's pretty likely that, that we've already get, got to uh, 1.5 degrees heating by 2030, but if we wanted a 50-50 chance of staying below it, we need to get down to net zero by 2050 at the absolute latest. That means drastic cuts by 2030, cuts to about half of our global emissions by 2030, reducing by about 8% from now every year. And it also relies on us removing large amounts of carbon dioxide from the air uh, for the rest of the century. Now, let's just be clear. We are not making emissions cuts. Emissions are still rising. We are nowhere close to being able to get to net zero by 2050. And we're also nowhere close to having the right kind of negative emissions technologies, NETs, the so-called known, known as, to be able to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere by 2050. So even this target isn't going to be enough and we're nowhere close to being able to meet it. That's why we need to act and we need to act right now. What this would mean would be a radical transformation of all of our sectors, not just here but across the globe. But we have to lead it here for various reasons which I'll talk about in just a second. If we wanted a two thirds chance of staying below 1.5 degrees heating, so remember that's the current uh, heating that we're heading for about around 2030, in other words, not getting to all those devastating impacts that we're predicted by 2050. So if we want a two thirds chance, a two in three chance of not hitting those 2050 impacts, we need to bring carbon emissions down, all emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions right now, really steeply, very, very fast. And at the rate we're going, we'll have used up our remaining carbon budget for that scenario within about eight years. So in fact, probably less now, about seven years. So we've really got to act fast. And just to show you that this isn't happening, this is what's happening to our carbon dioxide emissions, even since all of the warnings, the scientists warnings, the IPC warnings, IPCC warnings, the Paris Agreement, emissions are still going up. The UK government in particular are failing us. There's lots of talk of like, oh, well, UK emissions are going down. UK emissions aren't that great anyway. Not true. First of all, they have gone down a bit, but only in the power sector. And that's largely because we switched from burning uh, coal to burning oil and gas. But actually, um, once that stabilizes, emissions are likely to still continue to rise. Anyway, they need to be going down in all sectors, not just the power sector. And they're not. In addition, uh, fossil fuels are still being subsidised in this country by enormous quantities. There's a lot of facts and figures on this in the Emergency on Planet Earth guide. Um, there are huge amounts of investments in fossil fuels through the City of London, plus the, um, our carbon uh, accounting figures actually only account for the carbon dioxide emitted in what's called terrestrial uh, emissions on our own uh, soil. We don't therefore include, we haven't included, which is sort of sneaky accounting, uh, emissions from aviation, emissions from shipping. Also, what's enormous, enormous um, omission, omission, is that we don't include emissions from what's so-called embedded emissions, so stuff that we import. So we're basically outsourcing all our emissions to China and to other countries, we're investing in fossil fuels in other countries, we're buying stuff that's been made in factories that burn fossil fuels in other countries that are then burning fossil fuels to import them to this country, and then we say, oh look, our fossil fuels aren't, our emissions aren't that high. They're still twice as high as they should be in terms of the global average per head, um, and also we've got a larger responsibility because we're, we're a wealthy country, we've got the infrastructure to pull our emissions down, and we've got the largest historical responsibility for emissions because we started it in the first place with the Industrial Revolution. But just to show that actually we're not doing any of this, the latest um, Committee on Climate Change report came out in, in July, showed that of the 21 key indicators to show progress of the UK government uh, towards the 2050 target, only four after 21 were on track, 17 were not on track. Of the 31 milestones for actions that were recommended by the Committee on Climate Change, that's the statutory advisors of our UK government to get to net zero, only two out of 31 had been achieved and there'd been partial progress on 15, 14 showed no progress. And finally, the Committee on Climate Change said we should be now preparing 
the country, the, the world and the UK for a two degree rise by 2050 and a three or four degree rise by the end of the century, but yet no, very, very little adaptation and preparation has been made by the UK government. So I just wanna finish by saying, we have all the resources that we need to be able to deal with this. We know what to do. We can do this. We absolutely can do this, but we, at the moment, we don't have the will to do this. So the question is, what are we going to do? What is the use? This is one of our um, scientists for Extinction Rebellion team, Aaron Thierry, who was at one of our protests as a scientist saying, what is the point of having developed all this science if all we do is stand around and wait for it to come true? So what you can do just for the last couple of minutes and then we'll open this up. How can you help? Well, the first thing that you can do is what we're doing right now is just to simply absorb this, acknowledge it, face it, face it head on. Acknowledge what it's gonna, the impact it's gonna have in your body. Acknowledge that you might be feeling anxious. You might be feeling angry. You might be feeling shut down and overwhelmed. You might be feeling like you wanna go out and fight. You might be feeling like you wanna run away. You might be feeling like you just wanna hide under the duvet. All of that is valid. All of that is a natural response to what's going on on the planet. But until, and facing it doesn't mean you have to push through that. Facing it just means to be present to what is actually going on. So, Remember the words of the Dalai Lama, we can feel this, but actually we need to act. We need to use our power for positive change. And in the words of Christiana Figueres from the UN, her take on this was that we need to participate in nonviolent political move movements wherever possible. So what did I do? What I did is I co-founded the community Scientists for Extinction Rebellion. I decided to use my uh, skills and my passion for telling the truth and for communicating science in that context. Uh, we ended up going out onto the streets. There were just about five or six of us at the October 2019 rebellion, um, blocking streets, uh, protesting outside the banks, um, lying under banners in the road in our white lab coats. The police tried to move us on. They didn't actually arrest us at that point, but at the last protest this October, they did start, they did arrest a scientist. Um, uh, very quickly, uh, it was picked up by the press. So, you know, protests do actually work. Not only do we know that from the, uh, the mass uh, civil disobedience from, uh, from the hunger strikes by Gandhi, uh, the suffragettes, we know that Extinction Rebellion has worked because it's changed the Overton window, which means that more and more people are now talking about climate change. Governments are talking about climate change, not doing enough. Uh, people are talking about climate change. Um, protests, nonviolent uh, civil disobedience does work. And even the press, are now talking much more about not just climate change, but the protests themselves. This was in, in response to our scientists one. We've now got a much bigger group of scientists on board. We did another protest um, uh, in no last November and one again this autumn, much quicker, much smaller, obviously, because of the pandemic. Um, and culminating in a big protest in Trafalgar Square where we had 100 scientists wearing white lab coats and we were giving talks on the steps of Trafalgar Square. Uh, the other thing I'm personally doing just, just point of awareness is that, um, oh, and by the way, it enabled me finally to get on board with my wonderful partner, Kim Wei, and to actually work together for a kind of joint cause. So that was actually very empowering for me and for us and for our relationship. He was uh, leading the Samba band and I was on my megaphone with the scientists. Um, this is just uh, what the Emergency on Planet Earth document looks like. So the culmination of my last year and a half since finding out about this and uh, co-creating the Scientists for Extinction Rebellion community was to write the Emergency on Planet Earth document. Um, and also uh, there's been a lot of uh, positive uh, feedback on that from experts across the globe, uh, really validating that this is all real science. Um, and finally, my kids book Brain Fizzing Facts, which was out last summer, I've just finished writing the sequel, which is called World Whizzing Facts, uh, which is out in May. Um, and that is largely, it's got a lot of information in it for young people about understanding the climate and ecological crisis. So that's my action. And the question is, what can, what can you do? Now, everyone needs to do just what is right for you, what works for you with your own skills and your passions that you already have. So if we all just do what we're capable of doing, we can actually solve the world's problems. So one thing you can do is to get informed, as I've said, find out about as much as you can and share that information, raise awareness, tell others, combat the skeptics, tell your kids, tell uh, your friends, your family, um, get people really talking even more about knowing what's really going on. 
You can make personal and professional changes in terms of what you do with your life, in terms of um, stopping flying, stopping using public, uh, using more public transport, eating less meat and dairy, insulating your home, switching to a green energy provider, making sure your money isn't invested in one of the many uh, big banks that invest the, the investments in fossil fuels. But be really, really clear with yourselves and with others, that individual action is not gonna cut this. It's not enough. It's not about what we can do. We live in a fossil fuel infrastructure. We live in a fossil fuel fueled society. It has to come top down. Even during the, the height of lockdown, when everybody stopped using, using uh, transport and, and shopping and everything, even then emissions only fell by about 17%. So individual action is not enough. Don't let the governments fool you into thinking that this is all your fault, that you just need to stop going on holiday or whatever it is. We need to get structural systemic top-down change and the best way that I've come across to do that is to get on the streets to join a protest group to 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 raise awareness to campaign to try to force the government to take action but a specific relevance tonight another thing that you can do that's very powerful is to ask your MP to back the climate and ecological emergency bill now I know that we're very very lucky here in Bedford I've been informed that your your green MP is already backing the bill which is brilliant um, but just to give you some information, the, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is a fantastic new, um, uh, I can't think of the right word, it's a fantastic new thing that's just recently happened. Um, it's a private member's bill which is being taken, tabled and taken through Parliament. Um, it's been written by scientists and lawyers and activists um, and it's been backed by charities and individuals and it's got the potential to become a hugely important move forwards. Um, it's... Uh, it's in, a, it's in order to tackle the climate and ecological emergency in terms of legislative law, in terms of um, the government itself. And it's asking for a citizens assembly that will put forward recommendations uh, to contribute to um, the work of government and parliament. The objectives of the bill is to make sure that the UK plays its fair and proper role in limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees. And secondly, to actively take a role in conserving the natural world. So it's addressing the climate side of, of the crisis and it's addressing the ecological side of the crisis. But what's important is that we need the majority of MPs to support the bill, which I believe we've got until around the spring, March time, I think, to get MPs on board, to give it a chance to become law. So if any of you are from other constituencies or you know people in other constituencies, that's a hugely important thing you can do. Talk about it on social media, talk about it in your communities, ask people to write to their MP to get their MP to back the bill. That's probably the single most effective and important thing that we can all do as individuals. Uh, Caroline Lucas tabled the bill in the first place. She, um, she's a, a great supporter of the bill. We need to come together in our response. And finally, Amnesty International has said that it's, this is a far-sighted aim to protect those at risk now and in the future. So with that, I'd like, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen um, and I would like to hand back over to Lucy and hand back over to all of you in a moment for any questions or any reflections on anything I've shared. But before we do that, given that we've just heard a lot of information, I've just talked very fast for just over an hour. Um, I'm gonna invite us all to just do another little bit of breathing, to just notice your heart rate might be breathing, might be going faster. Your breathing might be going a bit faster. You might be feeling anxious, overwhelmed, scared, confused, all of these different things. So I just wanna invite us to take a moment just to bring ourselves down a little bit. So again, make sure you're feeling comfortable, if you've kind of noticed yourself hunching up or getting agitated or sitting forward in your seat, I invite you now to relax your shoulders, to put both feet on the floor, to breathe, to put your hand perhaps on your belly or on your chest, to relax your jaw, to close your eyes if you feel comfortable to, to bring your awareness into your feet, into your bottom, into any parts of you that are in contact with Mother Earth indirectly through the walls or the floor of your home. And we're gonna do just a few deep breaths to finish. We're gonna again breathe in through the nose, deeply into the belly and out through the mouth. So we breathe in, two, three, four, five, hold, two and out, two, three, four, five, 
six, seven, one more. In, two, three, four, five, hold, two, and out, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And let's just take this final moment. We're going to do a big deep breath in and a big sigh on the out, sigh and ah on the out breath. And as you do, you might want to wriggle your shoulders, wriggle your body, give yourself a little jiggle or a little shake. So we're going to do big deep breath in and then big ah, let it all out. <sighs> okay. So handing over, I suspect, shall I hand over to you, Lucy, to sort of um, Emily, help facilitate. Thank you. Comments. Thanks so much, Emily, for such a wide ranging talk that covered so many important issues. I love the connections you made that you didn't ignore the ecological crisis, which is often ignored, the extinctions, the ecological collapse, the sort of references you made to, to what nature does for us. Um, in terms of sort of ecosystem services and also the emotional reaction, you know, dealing with the sort of the mental health issue because a lot of us feel every day sort of helpless and despair. Um, so thank you, really wonderful. We'll definitely be sharing this. So really great that we could record it. Um, I want to just touch on that for a second, Lucy, because actually you, you touched on something really important that, that a lot of us are feeling that on an everyday basis. Um, and I just want to really, again, reiterate that just it's OK to be where you are with this. You don't need to do everything and you certainly don't need to do it right now. I certainly fall foul to that a lot and then just burn out. And I end up just trying to do it all very quickly and then burn out. So, you know, if you're feeling overwhelmed, actually, the most important thing now, today, this week, this month might be just to a lot of radical self-care. You know, whatever it is that works for you, a walk in nature, a bath, a glass of wine what with the dogs you know kickboxing judo yoga <laughs> gardening you know that's that's just as important because sustainability on our planet comes from sustainability for us as individuals so we need to be sustainable if we're going to help this planet on whatever way is right for us then then we need to first of all make sure that we can be sustainable that we can sustain ourselves and we need to come from self self-care and self-love so yeah, let other people do it if you're feeling overwhelmed. Let other people take that baton for a bit. And then when you're ready, go out there and do whatever's right for you. Thanks, Emily, very well put. I think we could all agree with that. Um, so some questions we've had, but feel free to keep typing some questions. So the first one we had was a really good one from Annie. She said, um, scientists' voices have been shut up, data neglected discredited, et cetera, by the power, influence, and money of big business, true or false? If false, why haven't your voices been heard? Okay, so scientists' voices. This is a really important uh, nut to crack in terms of there's a lot of misinformation and sort of wrong, judgmental, I think, information around this. Scientists' role, the role of a scientist, is to report impartially on facts, is to find facts, to investigate and to report impartially on those facts. A scientist is not supposed to be emotional. That's a terrible thing for me to say. I mean, in terms of their reporting. A scientist is not supposed to give opinion. A scientist is not supposed to say what should be done with the facts. A scientist is supposed to trust that the media will report on the facts and that the uh, governments will act in accordance to the facts. So, the contract of the scientist, the unspoken contract of the scientist is that that has been fulfilled, as in the scientist's role has been fulfilled. And scientists have had it drilled into us from all of our training, from all of our education, that the other stuff is not our role, it's not our domain, that it's up to the government what they decide to do with, with that information. So it is very hard for scientists to come out of that role because it's effectively, effectively breaking our promises of, of who we are as scientists. The first scientist to really do that was James Hansen. Um, and I did, a, I did a Radio 4 documentary, Green Originals documentary, which is, uh, you can Google it and find it. Uh, it's called, uh, remember what it was called, Kimway? I think it was just called uh, Green Originals James, ha James Hansen. It's on my website, um, which talked about, you know, the first sort of going out and James Hansen coming out and saying, you know, climate change is happening in the 1980s. Um, and this is real and, and nobody, nobody really listened. And 
why haven't they listened? Well, that's a whole nother topic for another, another conversation. But I think it's really important that we don't blame the scientists, but I think it's also important that we now realize that scientists are getting on board. Uh, thank you, Kimway's already shared the link. You're so efficient. Um, scientists are getting on board, thank you. Um, and scientists are taking to the streets. We've now got um, 1,700 scientists who've signed our declaration in support of nonviolent direct action, who are either themselves taking effectively illegal action or are supporting other scientists to do so. There are 11,000 scientists who have issued, uh, who have uh, been involved with a report that said that uh, it's clear and unequivocal that we are in a climate emergency and that um, there's going to be devastating, in, in, devastating impact on life, on human life. So scientists are getting involved, but they haven't been listened to in the past. And, you know, I don't think we've probably got time to discuss here why. I think we can all you know, draw our own conclusions as to why. But I know Kim Wei also wanted to comment on this because Kim Wei, um, uh, well, he can explain for himself. Kim Wei, what was your reason for commenting on this and, and why? Um, yeah, so oh, I wonder where this recording is going. OK, so um, I became close to somebody a few years ago who was working in the civil service. They're a climate scientist. They were advisor to the Minister for Climate. And when I asked them why the information wasn't getting across, this is ignoring the suppression um, factor, which is there as well. We know that from the latest Attenborough. But just on a basic level, why, why, is, why is your job not working out? I was asking this person. And one thing they were saying was, well, for a start, the Minister for Climate is not a climatologist. They're not even a scientist. This is not something we do in UK government. Um, so she was having real problems explaining to the ministers what the climate situation was because they didn't have a background in science. And there's something really unique about climate science in that it's future prediction. So ordinarily government might say to the scientists, okay, so you're 80% sure, come back when you're 100% sure. When it comes to a complex global system and, and that we're asking science for future prediction, they're pretty much only gonna get to 100% certainty of anything when it's actually happening. And in the case of climate science, when, it, when the disasters are actually happening, it's too late. So there was a sort of inbuilt, not lack of understanding about what the science was saying. And there's also a difficulty with scientists and non-scientists in science communication in terms of the likelihood scale. If a scientist says something is likely, it's 60% like 66% likely or more. If you and I were to say something was very likely, how likely would you think that might be? Maybe 70%? On the scientist likelihood, the science likelihood scale, it doesn't become very likely until we get to 90%. So there are inbuilt difficulties with understanding climate science for non-scientists. And then finally, there was this real hope from uh, the, the, gov the, the ministers that we would be able to rely on third generation technologies, which were basically carbon capture. And the science was saying, the scientists were saying basically these it's very embryonic, it's not been tested at scale. And they were saying, we'll come back when you've tested it. And again, the scientists are saying, well, this is going to be too late. So there were a lot of inbuilt communication problems and with also like a seeming unwillingness that contributed. And that was very revealing for me. Also a, d a delay and we don't know why um, exactly. There's a, su a, a su likely suppression, but the Met Office um, in, in the UK announced that human caused climate change was 95% certain, which is as certain as they ever say anything is really. Um, they said that in 2014. The BBC stopped reporting on the climate debate and started reporting on climate change as not being a debate, not until um, summer 2019. So there's a real, there's a five year delay there. Anyway, that's it, I'll hand back to Emily. Wow, thank you, Kimwin, that was amazing. Um, and also to add to that, that the BBC might be saying that they say that it's a climate emergency, but actually there was a report on, uh, oh gosh, help me, who remembers, which, which one was it? Uh, Radio 4. Uh, so it's uh, currently, no, it's, it's not an emergency by the BBC. Yes, exactly. So the Today programme basically said the so-called climate emergency and a load of people wrote in um, and they wrote back a generic response to everyone saying, well, um, it's still a debate. It's still up for debate whether it's an emergency. That's not true. You know, that's just not true. Um, 
and you know yeah what Kim Wei says about uh, about the certainty thing is really really important here and that's why actually what I didn't mention and it probably needs mentioning is that that's why uh, scientists are now really trying to call for the use of the precautionary principle the precautionary principle is the idea that you act according to what is likely to happen rather than what is absolutely definitely going to happen that you act according to if something is you know there's pretty good chance of it happening and, and it being really bad if it does happen um, then then we should act on that um, rather than saying well let's wait until it's definitely going to happen by which time it will absolutely be too late and also as Kim Wei said scientists never say definitely you know even 99% is not called definite um, and you know the the analogy that everyone uses is like you know would you get on your would you put your kids on the plane if there was a one in 20 chance of it going to crash and like in, in science world that would be incredible that would be very unlikely you know or very if it's a you, you get what I'm saying. <laughs> um, cool. Okay. Thank you, Kim Wait. Um, yes, John, for both of you. Yes. Yeah, so you've see, seen in the chat some of you. I don't know if all, you've all of you can see the chat. Ben's comments about John Fuller, who you may know, who's right. worked very hard in covering the BBC solids about this. Absolutely. So he's a good person to follow. And there's a community in Extinction Rebellion called Media Tell the Truth which are a really great community of journalists, ex-journalists, producers, I work with them as well, who are working to kind of, uh, to talk to uh, the media. Great. Uh, cool. Is there another Thanks, question? Emily. So shall we move to ne the next question? Yeah. Um, so this is a question from Andrew, who really enjoyed your talk and he's found it very useful. He said, people often ask what the impacts of a 1.5 degree or two degree yeah increase world would look like do you have any effective talking points to those yeah, questions absolutely absolutely uh, really great question because people get very confused between degrees and when so everything that i've said in this presentation that's to do with the around the 2030 mark so basically everything that's happening so far and everything that's sort of like around now that's taking us up to 1.5 degrees so 1.5 degrees is where we're going to be at about 2030 at the moment. So everything in the presentation, in the video you saw that said the 2030s, that's what happens at 1.5 degrees. Everything that you see, or that you heard me say, or that you see on the video, or that you read in the Emergency on Planet Earth guide, everything that says 2050 or 2050s, those are the current predictions for two degrees. Does that clear that up? If not, I can, I can talk a bit more to that. So yeah, 1.5 uh, degrees is, uh, is everything around 2030 in this talk and in the Emergency on Planet Earth guide. So I've divided it into temperature uh, and years. So hopefully they should be synonymous in the guide. Um, in the guide, wherever it says 2050, we're talking two degrees. In the guide, wherever it says um, what's happening now, we're talking basically the run up to 1.5 degrees. Of course, that's on current projections. That's why we have to go with where we are right now. Um, um, and of course, there is variation around that. Thanks, Emily. That, and, and that's Andrew, super helpful. Being... Thank you. Sorry, sorry. I said that's super helpful. Thank you. Just in terms of like, like correlating the years to the to the degrees, because exactly. I was getting the years, and then but people often ask when they're thinking about Paris, what does it mean? Exactly. So that's really helpful. So one point. You know, as many personal stories as possible. Have they got children? You know, what's it going to do? Um, talk about. Um, the impacts on on migrants refugees you know 
So you know, that's a very contentious issue. That's going to get worse. It's going to get a lot, 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 lot worse. Um, talk about the pandemic. Do we want another pandemic? This pandemic was almost certainly brought about because of the knock-on impacts of climate change. So there's lots of ways of trying to make it personal, people's personal into people's lives. I think that's the best way of getting people on board. It's really hard though when they've got a vested interest. Don't ask me about Trump. <laughs> Thanks, Emily. Oh, I can see this one here. Go on, so, go on, Lucy. What's next? Oh, you can see the next one. Um, the, from Nikki, can you see that? Yeah. Can, yeah. Yeah. This is another tricky point. So I'm glad you've asked this because this is another place where I certainly got very muddled when I was first trying to get my head around all of this. So the IPCC have, using all of their models, have shown that if we want, if we want a 50-50 chance of staying below 1.5 degrees, so 1.5 degrees or below, in other words, not going anywhere close to two degrees, which is crucial. If we want a 50-50 chance of that, we need to get, bring global emissions down to net zero by 2050. I'll say that again. If we want a 50-50 chance of being able to stay below 1.5 degrees, we need to bring global emissions down to net zero by 2050 which is what global, a lot of global um, governments have promised, which isn't happening. If, if we want, um, in order to do that, we need to bring emissions down immediately and we need to bring them down by 50%, by half, by uh, 2030. If we want more than a 50-50 chance of being able to cap heating at 1.5 degrees, in other words, not to go over towards two or even worse, then we need to bring emissions down much, much faster. Now, to me, even a 50-50 chance sounds ridiculous. It's like, OK, let's glo get global emissions down to net zero by 2050. Well, first of all, we're not doing that anyway. But second of all, even that would only give us a 50-50 chance. That's like playing Russian roulette with three bullets in the canister. It's like, what? And everyone's going, hey, let's just do that. It'll be fine. It's like, no. So um, if that's still not clear, ask me again, because I've spent quite a lot of time trying to get my head around this and I might not have explained it totally clearly. Um, Nikki, did you want to come back? You look like you wanted to add something. Yeah, sorry. Thank you, Emily. Um, yeah, it, I think it is clear. It's clear. It's it's the, the the question always in my mind is why do we focus on a 50-50 chance as because the 50-50ness of it doesn't seem to be broadcast very clearly. Um, and then, you, you know, to say and, you know, that's only for a 50-50 chance as an afterthought seems like quite a drastic sort of is that so we can get away with it a little bit more or um, yeah, what, do you, um, what do you think i mean they're just trying to get away with anything aren't they like yeah it's not happening anyway that's not even happening and they're making a promise to do something that isn't happening and that isn't anywhere close to being keeping us safe i mean if you look at any of greta Thunberg's talk she always just says and that's just a 50 50 chance yeah right? so but it's not being talked about you're right yeah. um, uh, I guess I guess one of the reasons is that even getting down to net zero by 2050 is going to be really really hard. It's going to mm. require radical change, and most people don't want to make change. And that's that's where individual action also comes in: is that we can't do this by making personal change, but we can show governments that we're willing to change by making personal change. So if we change the way we shop, oh, I didn't talk about um, consumerism. That's a massive thing we can do in personal change: is buy less stuff buy more second hand, recycle, repair, reuse, you know, kids all know this stuff, um, you know, stop kind of like outsourcing all of our carbon emissions. And um, we need to show the governments that we're willing, that we're willing to make these changes, that we're willing to use less, um, lose our cars less, that we're willing to, you know, electrical ve electric vehicles are better, but not great. They're not actually, they don't actually reduce emissions by, well, they reduce emissions to about a third. So that's better, but not great. Um, or by about by a third, I think it is, um, to a third. But the, the, yeah, the point is, is that that is where, to me, where it, where individual action comes in is, is to basically show governments that we're willing to change. Because coming back to your question, perhaps they're thinking, well, even getting down to net zero is going to require enormous change, and no one's prepared to do that. But you know, no one's prepared to do that. But do we all want to see our children grow up in a world that's as devastating as is as is coming? You know, it seems crazy to me. Thanks for that, Emily. 
Um, so you can probably see the question from Ben that the next two questions are sort of related around um, COVID. Yeah. Um, so yeah. in case not everyone can see, do you, do you want to read out the question? Sure, so it's about the link between COVID-19 and climate change. Can I explain it a bit more? So the way I understand this is that, you know, there's a lot of counter theories around this. And I'm not sure if, if what, you know, what can be absolutely pinpointed, but the way I understand this, and certainly according to the Attenborough documentary that was on BBC recently about extinction, which is phenomenal, it's really great, very candid, very brave in terms of truth telling. Um, and what they talked about in that documentary and what we've talked about a bit in the Emergency on Planet Earth guide is, is how COVID came from bats, um, I think it went, did it go from pigs to bats or bats to pigs? I think there were pigs in there somewhere. Um, and, and then on to humans, because uh, the bat was in a market. That, but anyway, the point is, is that diseases are more likely to be able to move from animals to humans, the more that animals come into contact with humans, and the more that animals are forced to move from their natural habitats. So climate change, uh, deforestation, habitat loss, intensive agriculture, all of those are causing uh, animals to move from where they naturally live to other areas. As those animals move, they're more likely to contact animals, other animals that they don't usually mingle with. So there's more likely to be what's called horizontal transmission or actually vertical, but uh, from animal to another animal. Horizontal is between animals of the same species usually. Vertical transmission is going bet between different species. Um, and then once they've moved to another animal, that animal might then be an animal that is more able to transmit that disease, that pathogen, that uh, disease causing organism to a human. And that is what we're seeing. And that is what we're more likely to see in the future. Is that, does that answer your question? If it doesn't quite let me know and I'll see if I can clarify further. Okay, cool. Thanks Douglas. That's great. Yeah, thanks Andrew. Uh, thanks uh, Ben, that was. Um, so Andrew says, I was told about some interesting research at work, which found a real disconnect between people's stated interest living on climate change and their willingness to act on it. Oof, yes. I believe a lot of that is down to what we talked about in terms of stress levels and in terms of overwhelm um, and in terms of like everyone's scared, but people are, are, are too overwhelmed to act or they don't know how to act. They don't know what to do. And there's all this, oh, you know, let, let's just recycle our plastic bottles. I mean, a lot of what gets recycled ends up back in the ocean anyway sorry to tell you and it's you know recycling not gonna get us out of this mess so i think there's been a lot of deflection from government saying you know we should get people to make changes and then people get confused saying are we supposed to do things differently or are we supposed to the bottom line is is that it's very hard to know what to do as individuals and a lot of people don't want to get on the streets they don't want to take action you know it's a very uncomfortable thing for a lot of people but just remember in terms of protest groups there is a lot that you can do behind the scenes that doesn't involve being arrested that doesn't involve being on the streets that doesn't involve banging a drum or holding a mic megaphone just because that's something that you know I don't mind holding a megaphone Kim Wade doesn't mind banging a drum but lots of people you know contribute an awful lot to climate movements uh, through writing, through making tea, through running meetings, uh, through making posters, through creating music, uh, drawing, pic drawing artwork, you know, there's so many different ways of getting involved. So I think a lot of it is, is an overwhelm, is a paralysis of, of how it's just so big, you know, what do we do? How do we take this on? Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I think is going on. Um, shall I read the next question? Um, jobs and the economy. All of us in the green movement say business as usual cannot continue. Correct. A huge segment of our population, families and children, would face severe hardship if that happens as quickly as it needs to. Huh, both correct. Also correct. Yes, really, really uh, important point. Thank you for making that, Michael. Um, very challenging to know how to address that because, yes, you're absolutely right. If we were to make the changes at the pace that we need to make them, you know, 8% reductions in emissions a year from now on, um, that's going to be severe hardship as well. So I don't have an answer to that question. Um, you know, certainly for Extinction Rebellion, we we the, the <laughs> not as Michael. <laughs> the the take on that is that is that we don't advocate for solutions. That's why we advocate for a citizens assembly. Um, that's our third demand is a citizens assembly to make the, those hard choices, so that citizens get to, to make those hard choices themselves based on of course top expert information because it's it's hard it's hard to say you know if if 
you need your car to get to work or whatever it is to feed your family. Um, there's difficult choices to be made, but that's why you know having these conversations is so important, and that's why raising raising awareness is so important. That's why leading by example is you know, starting to make these changes now, starting to like make personal changes in your own life, transform your own business, transform the things that you're doing for your line of work, transform how you're acting in the world, you know, so that has a ripple effect. And then when we do have to make radical changes, hopefully when the governments hopefully will take this on, then it won't be such a shock and it won't come so quickly. But yeah, it's a big challenge. Climate jobs, Green New Deal. Just, yes, just thinking about um, the sort of economic challenges. of the Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And actually, that's a valid point. Sorry, just to come back to that is that I forgot to say, you know, you saw it in the video there, um, the World Economic Forum video, is that there's potential for huge numbers of new jobs, huge growth of the economy through climate uh, mitigation, through a sustainable green energy. There's a huge amount of, of, of possibilities through that, actually. So, yeah, that's a good point. Um, a good way to talked about to people sometimes is about the co-benefits locally i'm always talking to people about the benefits of dealing with this now so things like better air quality or tackling fuel poverty and creating a more equitable society but of, often it seems a bit far off to people and they just see the pain and not the gain so it's it's not um not easy exactly um, and a good point's just been made is that actually the pandemic's shown what the government can do that that um there are solutions already there. You know, we need money. The government needs to put money into them. The government needs to take subsidies away from fossil fuels, perhaps even put a carbon tax, a bit of a contentious issue, um, and put subsidies into green initiatives, green energy, all sorts of green initiatives, drawdown projects. Project Drawdown is a great place to look at for things like that. Um, and it can be done. People will do it. Individuals will change. The government will change. Yeah, Drawdown, nice. Lovely. So yeah, it is all possible. You know, as you saw in some of the quotes I showed, it is all possible. But what we need is the government to get behind it. Thanks, Emily. So I've got a question from Philippa. This is a very local question. You might not know about this. Oh, I saw about the incinerator. So I don't actually know about the um, impacts on the environment of incineration. But from what I understand, um, it wouldn't be any worse for the environment than just letting it rot. I can't see how it would be worse for the environment than just letting it rot, which is what would happen if it was just put in landfill. Well, it's, it's quite a big issue to discuss here. There, there are issues about um, the part particulate matter. Oh, OK, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so I'm not an yeah. expert in this area. And yes, yeah. I totally see that that would cause a problem in terms of, oh, so generating energy from it. Yeah, it's, like, it's about as efficient as a coal fired power station. And okay. it in yeah. the the waste from by lorry um so there'll be a lot of hgv movements every day because it runs 24 7 so constant movement bringing in material from far and wide so okay, okay. yeah so yeah slightly out of my depth on that one but yeah. um, well it is com some some people are for it but the, locally people are very opposed and it's um it's a battle that's Kind of being lost unfortunately locally with the council just signing a new contract with Veolia who are going to use the incinerator but the council in Bedford Borough and also Central Beds had always strongly opposed it so it's a horrible horrible position that we're currently in so yes we need to reduce our waste whatever we do so we've got few, incineration is burning plastic you can well you can hopefully you can all see the comments yeah um, um, I, in answer to the question about carbon tax, interestingly, I was literally having a conversation about this today because I was also saying, you know, surely that's a good thing to do. So I'm going to put in some links into the chat window that my colleague at, in the XR Scientist community sent me today to, um, as to why a carbon tax isn't necessarily uh, the way forward. Basically, the bottom line, as far as I can tell, is that um, the rate and scale of change needed is just too large to be done by effectively just changing the pricing on things but it can certainly help but it's uh just it's just probably not enough so there's a couple of links there that you can read through um excellent yeah should probably be winding up but there are two quite nice questions here about the climate assembly i wonder if we could finish with those uh, yeah let's do that um, um collins and um nikki's yeah. thank you so would a citizens assembly agree on sufficiently Ah, oh, good question. Probably not, but it's better than nothing. And sufficiently radical isn't going to happen 
my opinion is that sufficiently agricultural isn't going to happen by the government alone. You know, we're far more likely to get somewhere towards where we need to get to by at least letting people make their own decisions. Sorry, that's a very reductive and probably slightly glib answer. Um, but yeah, I don't know what does other people think. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. The recent climate assembly was a radical change. Yeah, exactly. Climate assembly. The whole the idea of a citizens assembly is government would have to listen if the, if they went went along with that idea for a citizens assembly. Um, would they agree on? Yeah. Will the government listen? I don't know. Nikki, how how positive are you feeling about the a citizens assembly and radical action? Are you feeling? I I enjoyed um, listening to the presentations. I thought it was very fair and scientific and. And from what I could see looking on the website, the response from a lot of, um, from the assembly, the, the biggest thing was about information that everyone was saying exactly what you said, Emily, why didn't we know about this? And then they did actually come up with some quite radical suggestions. But then since then, we've heard nothing. We've heard nothing from the government, even though it was set up by a government committee you know that it's like they're playing lip service let's set up this thing but then actually they're not responding to what this assembly sort of did or suggested so i started off feeling quite buoyant about it and then i'm now feeling like it was probably a waste of time sadly <laughs> oh sorry to hear that useful analysis colin did you have any thoughts i know you're very passionate about the idea of a citizens assembly um I'm open-minded about it. Uh, I can see the logic. Um, I fear that the Johnson government wouldn't listen. They don't listen generally. Um, I, I'd have thought that the, uh, that the evidence of the parliamentary uh, citizens assembly was, yes, there were some, some good moves in the right sort of direction. But I don't think it went particularly far. On the other hand, we could take heart from the French equivalent, which was more radical, I think, in lots of directions, but still probably not radical enough. I'm, I'm kind of open minded about it. Um, I think that uh, citizens assemblies do look as though they've been very valuable in Ireland over, over, the other, over other issues, but I don't know. Thanks, Colin. I think if everyone in the citizens assembly had been to a talk by Emily before, <laughs> You know, and had that information, that sense of urgency, then it might be a different, a different sort of kettle of fish, really. But um, we will do our best to <laughs> to keep sharing. Um, so we sort of need to wind up. Um, thank I, you so much, Emily. Did you want to add anything? Before, oh, uh, Ben's going to sum up. And yeah, uh, you go ahead and sum up in just a second. I was all I was going to say was that if people want to know more about me or more about my work or any any um any of the resources that i shared pretty much everything that i talked about loads of resources and things that i've done are all on my website which is just my name emilygrossman.co.uk uh, if you're on twitter uh, please do tweet about this because there's so much horrible stuff out there in the social media world so it's always nice if anyone's found this helpful um it's really useful um and also to raise awareness because it would be great if other people would be aware that I they are that I offer these talks so that I can kind of come into other groups and organizations and talk about this stuff. So you know unfortunately social media is a necessary evil for that. So yeah if anyone's on social media please do talk about it, share about it, tag me in. Um, and the emergency on planet earth document that I kept talking about it's on the Extinction Rebellion website but if you don't want to go to Extinction Rebellion website or if you want to uh, download it or print it I'm also I've also going to do it again I'm going to share the link to the Google document where you can read it offline download it and print it and do anything else with it that you want with my permission <laughs> full permission to do what you want to do brilliant so, thanks so that. much emily that's excellent so i'm going to hand over to ben he's going to do a quick summary and a few notices thank you ross that was a really nice comment whoever just wrote, wrote that <laughs> I can't hear anybody. Right. So, sorry about that. I, I couldn't work out how to unmute myself while sharing my screen. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Emily. Um, it's been really interesting, lovely to he hear you talk. Um, you know, and, you know, 
I already had prepared to um, make sure that people were, were aware of the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, and there's the, the URL for the website associated um, here for, for people. Um, you know, recording of tonight's talk will be available for anyone that, that feels like going back, referring to it again, um, you know, or sharing it with their friends, um, you know, and that, that will be on our, our local Green Party website. So lutonandbeds.greenparty.org.uk. Um, alternative ways of, of getting in, in touch with, with us as um, a Green Party group. Um, we're aware that not everyone in, in the room is um, a Green Party um, member supporter, but you know, if people are positively inclined towards the Green Party, there is also a Green Friends scheme which doesn't involve joining the, the Green Party as well, which is, is worth letting people know about. Um, you know, and you know, we have local activities that we're very much hoping that, that you know, people will be interested in. Um, and uh, the green drinks is just an open social activity for people in the Bedford area, you know, not too precisely defined, um, where we, we just get together and talk about green matters generally in a, in a social environment. So it's not big P political, you know, and it's, it's not organisational, it's just getting together and chatting and being sociable. Um, but um, there's also the the monthly critical mass um, cycle ride where we we managed to, to keep going through the worst of what was it storm Alex um, the, the wettest day of um, on, on record I believe they said happened to be the day that we we were out but that didn't stop us and we we've kept going through um, through COVID restrictions now um, so yeah very much hope that people will will, will come along and, and cycle with us for a while um, on on the relevant um, Saturdays um, you know and yes we do campaigning with the electorate as well doesn't matter that there aren't elections for quite a long time we still want to, to engage with with the electorate so you know there's a lot of ways that we as a political party can put pressure on that you know can add pressure to those that you know you were talking about Emily and you know we certainly by no means discount the, the sorts of techniques you were talking about um, either um, you know so you know a, a high proportion of, of local Green Party is also involved in Extinction Rebellion um, and very very proud to, to be so um, but, you know, we also see value in, in going down the, the political route as well. Thanks very much for your time this evening, Emily. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And thank you to Jeremy for inviting me in. <laughs>